soccer. Yes, they do. All right, let's get this day started off right with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that we are able to come together in your house and honor and worship you. We ask that you will be here with us today, that you will teach your words to our hearts, and that we will learn and grow more in you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, now we have an announcement video for you. been recorded. 
requested on the evening of June 1st for an evening of intrigue and mystery. Mr. Body has collected his favorite colleagues and relatives to decide who will inherit his great fortune. It could be you. So as you all just heard, on June 1st at 7 p.m., we are going to have a huge game of Clue. The entire church is going to be the playing board. If you are interested, please let us know so that we can plan accordingly to about how many people are going to be there. Also, should you wish to be a staff member or a suspect during this game, please let us know because spots are filling up very quickly. But we are very excited for this. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is open to anyone. Bring your friends, bring your family, let everyone know. And we hope to see you there. So if you guys are interested in attending or being actually a part of the setup of the game or anything, please let me or Caitlin know so that we can get an idea of how many people we expect to be there and, and whatnot. Hey, Pastor Cheryl. So on June 8th, what's going on with the G2 Women's Event? We are going to ride in the dunes. Ooh, what's that going to be like? They tell me it's a slow and scenic ride. They'll let us out a little bit. Uh, but it is over some steep hills. But they say it's slow and scenic. And how much is that going to cost? Uh, the cost for that is going to be $20. And then we're going to go to lunch afterwards. So whatever their lunch would cost them. All right. This sounds like fun. So June 8th, ladies. And to sign up in the back. And sign up in the back. All right. Can we have Jim up here to do our offering? Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Can I have the ushers come forward, please? Come ush. Okay. I'm going to read out of Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your guidance, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to sow into the ministry that you're doing here at the harbor. Lord, we ask that you take this offering and use it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take some time and greet our neighbors.
ready to worship the Lord this morning? Amen. Why don't you stand with me this morning as we get ready to worship? Lord, we just come before you this morning, God, and we want to give you all praise and all glory, Lord. God, we want to uh, just say that we love you this morning, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you.
your beautiful heart. I just pray as we move on with our service this morning, God, that you would just speak to us this morning, Lord. Praise your name. How many of you guys had a problem and you thought, maybe if I just ignore it, it's going to go away? <laughs> you know, sometimes we think if I ignore something or if I'm complacent in something, it's going to just fix itself and be fine. But a lot of times, and I would say most of the time, that's not really what happens. You know, I remember uh, a few uh, years ago, I was coming home from uh, family camp. And I had my trailer in tow behind me, and I'm just cruising down the road, just not a care in the world, just driving. And Brian and Deese came up next to me, and they're like, hey, you got a window open. And I think to myself, eh, not that big a deal. Maybe the curtains will blow a little bit in the wind or the things. You know, not a big deal. And I was very complacent in what they were telling me. But, you know, today that's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover complacency. We're continuing our series on the book of Amos. And uh, in, the, in this series, I'm really excited because we've already covered one of the four major themes throughout this book. This is a powerful, powerful book. You don't hear a lot of preaching from this book, mostly because people think it's a very negative book. But I don't see it that way. I see it as something that positive, that we can address some cultural issues and maybe see the Lord do a great work in those issues and to see us move forward in victory. Amen? amen. Great. There's like half of you here. All right. Everybody else, amen? amen. All right. Let's do this. Now, uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, during our uh, episode Sunday, Star Wars uh, and sci-fi, I should say, uh, theme, we had covered that everyone answers to God. And that was the first major theme in the book of Amos, is that everyone answers to God. And I covered three main issues. We covered the eight prophetic judgments. We covered how God had jurisdiction over everything. And then we had covered God's justification. So we covered his judgments, we covered his jurisdiction, and we covered justification. And that is something amazing that we need to understand about the book of Amos is that it wasn't just God's people who were being judged, but it was also the nations surrounding them. That God's judgment and his jurisdiction is over everything that he created. And when you create everything, that means you got jurisdiction over everything. You know, today um, our, I want to cover our main verse for this entire series, and it is this. Amos chapter 5, verse 24. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. This is what this whole series is based off, is the justice of God. And uh, in our first uh, episode, episode, <laughs> in our first uh, sermon uh, for this series, we had covered uh, all about the life of Amos and how God's judgment is just. That God's not just being up there being a mean, vengeful God, but that he's looking at the sins, the wrongs these people were committing and said, I can't allow this to happen any longer. And God stepped in and intervened in humanity when humanity was doing what was wrong. 
And so God's justice is just. Now in these ancient manuscripts, we can see that Amos' message has gone throughout the time and has ministered to people throughout time. And even to this day, this message still should ring true in our hearts and minds today. Not only us as individuals, but also us as a nation. As Americans, we should sit back and go, man, does this apply to us as a culture today? And, you know, we look at Amos. He was preaching to a group of people that were uh, the people of God, but they were divided up into two nations. You had the northern nation, which is the nation of Israel, and you had the southern nation, which is the nation of Judah. And Amos, he was a fiery preacher from the uh, nation of Judah, and this guy had no compromise in his heart. He was an honest, fiery preacher. And he came up and proclaimed the word of God to a people who were, as we're going to discover today, were complacent. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Amos chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. And what we're going to do is we're going to discover what it says in those uh, verses. And once we've discovered that, I'm going to tell you why this complacency happened in their lives and then also how to deal with said complacency in our own lives as well. Amen? You guys ready for this? All right. Everybody's like, I want some deeper stuff. Well, you better get ready. Here we go. All right, let's do this. Anytime it starts off with the words and it starts off with here in verse 1, you better pay attention. Because when it says, woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come, go to Kanah. And look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath. And then go down to Gath in Philistia. In Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds uh, inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlfuls and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your Feasting and lounging will end. As I said, Amos was a fiery preacher. He pulled no punches. He told it how it was. You know, in our day, we would say he was a fire and brimstone prophet because he was out there and he's like, y'all need to repent because something bad's about to happen. And his words came true. But let me uh, take some time to explain this verse and go into some detail. You guys ready for it? All right. This is Zion's complacency. If you look at the first part of the verse, it says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion and to you who feel secure about Samaria. Now, if you look at who he is talking to, the prophet is addressing uh, two places. He says, first of all, you are who are complacent in Zion. Now, if you know anything about Zion, it is, uh, usually represents the uh, city of Jerusalem. That's why in our modern days, we call them Zionists, because they are the people of Jerusalem. Now, in this particular context, it is like saying, you are who are the people of Washington, D.C. Of course, we would know that the person who is addressing us would be addressing us as Americans, Right? Let me explain that again, because I'm getting deer in hellies. So if we were to say, if someone were to say to us, you who are of the people of Washington, D.C., we would know that that is the capital, right? Okay, did we study in school? All right. <laughs> Washington, D.C. would be the capital. And, uh, but anyways, we, here's the thing. Is we would know that they were addressing the nation of America, of the United States. Well, in this particular context, we know that when they said, you people of Zion, that it is actually addressing the people of the nation of Judah, which was the southern kingdom. Now, when it said Mount Samaria, what the, where, that was the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom. So when they were addressing them, and they, you feel secure 
He's saying to you Israelites, you feel secure, but woe to you because you're complacent. You're complacent. So here are the um, fiery preacher goes and prophesies to the people and says, woe to you. Woe to you, people of God. Now here the uh, Amos, uh, he prophesies over them and indicts them in judgment. Now, what about this word complacency? What is the depths of understanding of the word complacency? So what I did was I went ahead and went on Webster's Dictionary, and I looked up just the word complacency, and I wanted to see what it is so that we would have a better understanding of the word itself. And the word itself in the dictionary says this, self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. So self-sufficient, unaware of dangers or deficiency. That's complacency. So in essence, they were not aware of the danger of their sin. They were unaware of what was happening around them. They were deficient in their relationship. Right? You know, Amos here is basically telling the people, wake up! Woe to you! Wake up! And that's what he was saying here to the people. Now, let's go ahead and dive into this. And uh, let's study this. Some of you are feeling really tense. Are you fighting this? Um, because, you know what? We're going to pray afterwards. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, I fight complacency. I fight complacency in my own life, maybe with a little bit with my phys physical health. I fight complacency maybe in uh, training up and, and discipling my family. I can fight some uh, this complacency in multiple areas of my life. So this is a message that I agree for myself to, as Amos would say, wake up, to not be complacent, to be intentional in my life. So if you are feeling it a little tense, don't worry. I'm going to give you three things to take home to be able to combat complacency. So don't be all depressed because this is a really powerful message and I don't want you to check out. All right, so let's talk about some grim realities of complacency. And we see here, once again, he starts off and says, Woe to you who complacent in Zion, who feel secure in Mount Samaria. Then he says, You notable men of the foremost nation to whom people, the people of Israel, come. See, here he reminded them of their complacency. And he tells them that, hey, all these people in your nation, they're coming to you. So who is he talking to? Well, let me tell you who he's talking to. In our day, he'd be talking to the politicians, the leaders. See, the grim understanding of who was going on in his nation is all these rich, prominent people, all the people in the nations were coming to them for advice instead of to their priests and prophets. They went to the politicians to run their nation. <laughs> Here's another grim thing that I would say is a great illustration. These people were actually longing for, even in their veneer of religion, even in their uh, idolatry and self-indulgence, even in the midst of their complacency, they still were all in fire for the coming of the day of the Lord. But Amos addresses this in a few verses before, and this is why I know this is to be true. Amos chapter 5, verse 18 says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. And we know by other scriptures that that will be the days of Jacob's troubles. When before Christ comes to establish the millennial reign, that this world will be a time of trouble. So Amos is like, why are you guys looking for the end and destruction of the world? He goes, man, stop it. Wake up. And he was a fiery preacher that was excited about maybe their repentance and turning to the Lord. But the idleness and the ease of these self-indulgent people, this prosperous nation, these people who lived in luxury, you know, sat on, you know, couches, uh, beautiful couches, and had these beds inlaid with ivory, and just was all about comfort. He condemned them and said, you know what? Our 
God's a God of justice. Just as much as he loves you, he's also a God of justice. He is a just God. He will not let this complacency go unchallenged, but he will discipline us accordingly. And he tried to get them to repent. You know, if we look at what he says here, uh, to give them an illustration of repentance, to try to humble them down from their purchase. This is what he said in verse 2. If you look at there in chapter 6 of Amos, it says this, Go to Calneh and look at it. Go from there to great Hamath, and then go down to Gath in Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off that evil day and bring near a reign of terror. See, these nations that were surrounding Israel, what he was actually doing, doing during the time of Amos, he was looking at these nations. They once were rich. They once were powerful. They once had great vast armies. And they once were flourishing and had land and all the things that the nation of Israel had at this time. And he basically looked at them and said, are you better than them? You think you are? Are you better than them? And it wasn't like they were comparing them to somebody that was existing at the time. But what he was actually saying is, every one of these nations, look at them. They're in ruins. They don't even exist. These cities, these nations, these, they've been wiped out. Their cities were all in ruins and destroyed. But yet they were once rich, powerful, and prominent. But he's like, hey, you are about to be like them. You will go this way unless you wake up. That's what Amos was saying to the people. You know, we look at their king, Jeroboam. He had many victories, and, and he expanded Israel's territory. They had this sense of national pride. They knew that they were God's chosen people, that the military-wise, they were powerful, they were strong, they were unbeatable, they thought. They had, of course, religious morality. They thought we are the most moral people on the earth. So not only are we powerful, but we're also moral. We're better than everybody else. But what they were blind to in their complacency is what it says here in verse 4. It says, you lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and the fattened calves. What they were doing was, is they were being self-indulgent. They were indulging on all these things of their culture. They were rich and they were eating high-protein meals all the time. They were having these beautiful beds. I'm not thinking, I am not against meat. Hallelujah. Uh, But but what I'm saying is, is they were living it large. Why the people were living in poverty underneath them. They were living large. And as we're going to address in a moment, they weren't caring for their neighbor. Here's the thing, is these guys were so rich and so powerful that they became complacent. I love what it says here in verse 5. It's crazy if you think about it. It says, you strum away on your harps like David and improvise on your musical instruments. You know what they were doing? Is they were being hypocritical. David was a man that loved God with all of his heart and that when he played, even evil spirits went away from him. The anointing was so strong on David's life. When Saul was vexed, David started playing and this evil spirit was like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm out of here. And it even calmed the nerves of Saul. He was so anointed, but yet these guys were taking the same instruments, maybe even as a form of sacrilegious in a form of being sacrilegious, they would take these instruments that were designed for worship and they were using them for self-indulging parties, having all kinds of things and you know, making music for themselves to praise themselves. It's very possible that they did it in a very sacrilegious way as well. And we can see that by verse 6. If you look at verse 6, it's crazy. It says, you drink wine by the bowlful and you use the finest lotions, but... You do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Here's the thing. In our modern language, drinking wine by bowlfuls, what that would mean is mean being you, you drink beer by the keg full. You drink beer by the keg full. You know what I'm saying? 
That's what this was kind of the equivalent of. Because that word there in the uh, Hebrew is the same word that is used in 1 Kings. And that word is talking about the basins, those large basins that they would do for ceremonial cleansing. They would use either blood or water. And these were huge basins. And what they would do is he's basically saying, you know those large bowls, those basins that we use for worship? You drink wine by that thing. It's huge. It's, in our modern day, it would be like, you, you get so drunk, you buy a keg and you drink it by yourself. That's what he's referring to. He's in your, 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 your defaming, defaming the very instruments that were designed to worship God, and you're using them for your own parties and your, your drunkenness and, and self-indulgent debauchery. These things these people were doing. They were so complacent and self-indulgent that they ignored their brothers. They ignored those who were in poverty. That's what it said about Joseph there. They were so um, uh, not concerned for the middle class because the middle class was pretty much self not existing anymore. There was this great divide. You only had the upper echelon of class, which were the rich folk, and then you had most of Israel, which were the poor. And the rich in the land didn't care for the poor. They didn't care for their brothers and sisters. They just cared about their own indulgences, their own power, their own glory, their selves. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when we do a little bit of comparison to our culture, you can see a lot of the things that we've seen in that nation of Israel you know, about self and what we want. Well, let, let, me, let me simplify this even more to the church. Can I meddle a little bit? One person, that's permission. All right. All right, here we go. Now, I'm going to be talking about not just the church universal, but I'm also going to be talking about us as assemblies of God because we are not, uh, as a whole, you know, you know, excluded from any of these, uh, I wouldn't say judgments, but uh, things that can creep into the church. And we got to be careful of. So the first thing would be is uh, having a, a thin veneer of religion. And I'm going to be actually, this is one of the mega themes in Amos. We're going to take a whole week and to discuss this. But think about this for a moment. Does our culture long for preachers and teachers who will tell them how to get things from God? Do we preach about prosperity, self-indulgence? Let me tell you today, if you give $10, God's going to bless you and give you $100 back in fold. Send your check to us. <laughs> now, I believe you are supposed to give. The Bible talks about your local storehouse. And I'll be honest, I'm not just doing this as a plug, but our giving for the last six months has been really low. So I would encourage you to seek the Lord and do ask, that the Lord would uh, speak to your heart about giving to your local church. But on the other hand, too, it's not about so you can get something back, but it's about obedience to Christ. It's about the kingdom first principles so that we might see the kingdom advance. Did you know yesterday we gave over 50 hot lunches and 50 cold lunches out to the homeless and to the needy in our community? You know, those are things that our church is doing on a weekly basis. So we want to practice these things. And even if you have a chance, an opportunity, I would encourage you on Saturdays from 11 to 1, go down there and uh, volunteer for that. And, you know, if we think about it, does our culture long for preachers that, that just preach about the prosperity, about looking good, but maybe not necessarily doing good? Holiness is not preached as much as it probably should in our pulpits. And I'm not condemning others because maybe it's not in us as well. Maybe our desires need to be not the desires, um, I hope it's going to be a good sermon today because I want to feel good. Or is it going to be a good sermon that's going to cause conviction in my heart that I might change for the glory of God? That Christ would increase, that we, as John the Baptist say, I must decrease that he would increase. To have the heart that says the kingdom of God first. Now, We look at American culture, and we often look back and say, man, I see a lot of correlations with the complacency that's happening. And we're going to address that here in a moment. But I I don't be you guys, but I want to take the advice of Amos and to heed his warning. 
because we need to heed the advice that the Lord has given. Now, I want to I wanna address something here now. I'm going to go to my second point. And my second point is this, is the root of complacency. What I want to address is the three main things that we find here in the Israelites that caused complacency. Because I don't want to just say, don't be complacent. Here's what complacency looks like. But I want to show you why they became complacent. And in doing so, I hope that we can understand why maybe we can be complacent at times, myself included. Okay? So the first one is self-sufficiency. Remember the dictionary, the definition? Self-sufficiency. Now, these guys here, they exalted themselves. They had this great reputation. People came to listen to them. They sat there on their thrones and just, let me tell you what you should do. You know, they, they went around on skateboards trying to look young and cool. <laughs> He's meddling. Uh, <laughs> these people were blinded by their self-importance. These people were following their leaders instead of following God. These people were following the politicians instead of the priests. These people were self-sufficient, and they caused themselves to rest on their laurels while a danger grew outside of them. Matthew 19, verse 23 states this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because they were self sufficient. What do I need God for? I got plenty of money. I got plenty of power. I got plenty of security. What do I need God for? They were self-sufficient. That's one of the things that causes complacency. Because when you're of no need, when you don't need anything, then we have a tendency of forgetting the one who is our blessing. Yeah. Next thing is, is their self-security. You got to remember, these people, they thought they were blessed by God, so not only was God on their side, but also they had this vast military. They had this vast power. They thought, man, there ain't nobody can compare with us. Our army's the best. You know what? We got the new chariot uh, 5000 series. It's amazing. This chariot's faster than anybody else. It, it's more versatile. It, it can go up hills. It can go down. Man, our chariots are the best. Our horses are like, they're bred to perfect. Affection. They're so fast, man. We are our, our archers. They can they can pinpoint the back of the thing with their no problem. They're the best. Psalms warns against such arrogance. Psalms twenty verse seven says, "Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God." That's what the Israelites should have been doing. They shouldn't have been complacent, but yet they were self-secure. Our army's the best. There's no one that can stop us. Man, we have the best tanks. Oh, wait. We have the best planes. Oh, wait, they didn't. That's us. Complacent in a culture that should be going, uh-oh, there's been warning signs. There's been harbingers. We've had warning signs. We've got to be careful and not be complacent because when we feel secure is when we are the least secure. Now, at my house, I have a little uh, Simply Safe, just like we have here at the church. It's a, an alarm system. Somebody opens a door, comes in the house, you know, and motion sensors and all that, and it'll go off. Now, most of the time, I actually have this not necessarily to keep people out, but I actually have this to keep people in. Because my little boys, they are very smart. And we have all these little locks and little door things and stuff like that that they love to figure out. And we waste your money on, you know what I'm saying? Because these guys are like ninjas. They can climb out of their crib. They're like, oh, bars. I'll grab here. I'll grab here. I'm up. Woo! You know, and they can jump out of their cribs now. It's just crazy. So we're, we try to keep them, you know, contained. But the nice thing about having the alarm is in the middle of the night, I, don't, I can sleep because I, if they open the door, the whole thing goes, yeah, yeah goes crazy loud right so I, there's no way you can sleep through it so that's the nice thing about that security but the truth is if someone wanted to break in they probably could it might be noisy for them but they could so my security cannot rest in my security system it cannot w rest in smith and wesson it cannot rest 
What? No, you know, it cannot, it, cannot, it, cannot, it cannot rest in those things. My security is not in chariots and horses. Our security needs to be in the Lord, whether it's good or whether it's bad, trusting that he has everything in order. That's our security. The nation of Israel, they knew this. The people of Judah, they knew this. But yet they became complacent because they felt secure. The next one is they were self-satisfying. They were self-satisfying. Do you know how you can be self-satisfied? Whether you're rich or you're poor, it doesn't matter. They come from both sources, whether it's rich or poor. You know how the rich are self-satisfying? Well, they, went to their, they looked at their leaders. They were self-indulging in all the things of this earthly pleasures and drunkenness and uh, uh, carousing around and all those type of things. They took life at ease. That's one way complacency comes in. Now, the poor, complacency came in because they were overwhelmed. They were tired. They were uncertain. They did not have hope. Because of their poverty. And because they had no hope, they just didn't care anymore. They gave in to their self, you know, self-satisfaction in hopelessness. We look at our culture, and I see the same thing. The rich are so at ease, and yet the poor are so many times are so hopeless. We have a hopelessness epidemic in our culture. Because we have literally forsaken the value of humanity. Here's the thing. When you teach somebody that they are nothing but mutated pond scum and their life has no eternal meaning, they start acting like it. But when you teach them that they were created in the image of their creator, thus they have internal, intrinsic value, that they are beyond valuable that they have a purpose, they have a meaning. They were created for a purpose. And in that, people have value. But in our culture, we are materialists. So many people are pounding this materialist religion. And uh, it's something that we have to get past. And I'm not saying uh, do not look at the evidence. I say look at the evidence. All other religions except for Christianity, um, Muslims a little bit actually are pretty good at this as well. But they say, oh, no, you just have to have faith. Christianity says, no, no, my faith is based on the evidence. And I always tell people, look it up. Look up the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, and uh, you know, anthropic principles. You look at all these things. We're going to be teaching these on Wednesday nights, and I'm going to teach you some apologetic stuff uh, after I'm done with Peter. And I'm encouraging you, go deep, ask the questions, and understand your intrinsic value. Because you were created in the image of God and in his likeness. And through Christ, he has restored our likeness. These people were self Sufficient, self-secure, and self-satisfying. But what do we do with this? You might be looking at your life and going, you know what? I'm going to be honest. I'm complacent in areas. If you're like me, I'm complacent in areas. You know, uh, one of the things that I, I love about preaching is I get to preach from my heart. One of the things I hate about preaching is I have to walk it out the week before you do. So, uh, <laughs> so here's things that I, I, I had to do a self-examination. So you know what? I have areas in my life complacent. Today we're going to ask you to, uh, when I do the altar call, to maybe raise your hand and say, you know what? I'm fighting some complacency. And we're going to pray for each other. And you know what? Um, because I dealt with this early in the week, I might not raise my hand because I'm going to pray for you guys. But you know what? If I didn't, my hand would be up too. Because I think it's something that Bible says to bear one another's burdens. And in that, you know, we will see God do amazing things. You know, let's, let's move on because I want to give you three things to destroy complacency. Everybody say destroy. Destroy. You're so violent. All right. <laughs> All right. Let, let's talk about conquering complacency. Truth is, everyone here fights complacency from time to time. Every one of us fight it from time to time. It is a common temptation for those who are living a wealthy nation. Did you know the poor in America are stinking rich? 
We are a rich nation. I've been in multiple places around the world. Our poor are rich. Okay, we are a rich nation. Now, there are some people that choose not to use the benefits of our nation and live in even more extreme poverty, and that happens. I'm not, not, I'm not you know, uh, neglecting the view of that. But what I am saying is this. We are a poor, rich nation just like the Israelites and Judah were. So we need to really examine our hearts in these areas. Now, I want to read you guys a cool paragraph. This paragraph is a quote from somebody, and I don't know who it is the quote from, but it really has some really good insight, and they give you some good understanding of complacency. You guys ready? All right, here we go. It invades areas once occupied by passion, interest, desire, and focus. When complacent, the valued things that have captivated our thoughts, hearts, and energies tend to fade from priority and can even become mundane or the boring routine of everyday life. Burnout in our work life, loss of fire in our relationships, and the lack of zeal for things that once held importance are common experiences. The shame is not complacency, but the failure to recognize it and to take corrective measures to regain your footing. Did you catch that? A lot of depth in that paragraph right there. Here's the thing. First thing you need to do is the G.I. Joe principle. How many guys played with G.I. Joes growing up? Oh, you poor people. (laughs) If you didn't play with G.I. Joes, come on, man. It's all about G.I. Joes. Now, G.I. Joes. What's G.I. Joes mantra? Yes, go Joe. What else is it? (laughs) That is true. Go Joes. What else? What do they say? Did you get? Knowing is half the battle. Yo, Joe, yo. Knowing is half the battle. In complacency, being self aware, it's half the battle. Knowing that you have complacent areas of your life, the first step is awareness. See, the main purpose of, of Amos' preaching to the Israelites was not to condemn them, but to repent them, to have them turn from their complacency. Turn to God and in repentance. You know what? The same thing we need to do today. The two major sources of complacency in our culture is simply this. Too busy or not busy enough? Too busy? Pastor, we just can't do that because I just don't have time in my life. I'm just too busy. Well, the Bible does say seek the kingdom of God first, and all these other things should be added. Amen? Amen. All right. And then when it says not busy enough, oh, I just don't want to. Yeah, I probably could, but ugh, I don't want to. I'd rather watch this. Moving right along. All right. (laughs) Some self-awareness. It's important. See, the problem in our society and the society of the Israelites, that they were led and they thought that life was great because I am blessed. But when their complacency stepped in, we need to do what we need to do here, which is reclaim our vision. Reclaim our vision. Imagine in your life God restoring the passion and the calling of your first salvation. Imagine the Lord coming back alive in your heart and being on fire for him and working and serving the Lord and seeing things of eternal value overshadow things of earthly um, decay. Fighting for the things that are eternal compared to the things that are temporal. I think that passion in our hearts. Someone once said, you can know where you're at with the Lord when you have a passion for the lost, and if your passion is gone, then maybe your passion for the Lord needs to be rekindled. And that's something we, I examine my own heart, and I go, hmm, 
Am I passionate for the lost? Am I passionate for the things of God, for people to be discipled? Am I passionate to be around the people of God? Am I passionate to see God's uh, kingdom advance into our culture? Am I passionate about seeing people in the church being discipled and trained and, 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 and grow in Christ? Am I excited to have the things of the Lord uh, about me, to be about the Father's business? Is that what burns in my heart? Or has the thin veneer of religion set in? Those are things we have to examine our hearts. And I love you enough to preach this gospel. Because this is good news. Because as soon as you're self-aware of these things, then you can ask the Lord to rekindle the vision of your call in your life. Uh, that's something I pray uh, uh, almost daily. And I pray, well, during the week, five days a week, I pray this. The weekends, I don't. Um, just, but I do pray this during the week. And I pray that the eyes of my heart would be enlightened that I would know the hope of my calling and for the glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. This is part of my prayer, and this is something that I would encourage you to pray as well, to understand the hope of your calling. Amen? Amen. Because you guys have a calling that will change the world for eternity. Woo! You, Amen. I thought that was good too. Amen. <laughs> And here's the thing, I'm not going to sin to make you feel good today, which means I'm not going to lie to you. I believe that every person in here will change somebody's life for eternity. So you've got to ask yourself, who is the God called me to disciple? Who has God called me to reach out to? Who has God called me to love on? Who has God called me to care for? Who has God called me to change? Open up your eyes and heart and look at your brother Joseph. Don't look at the ivory bed or the couches of, of, that are so soft and cushy. But look at the ruins of a nation that needs Jesus so bad. And know what? You can do it. Remember your vision. Remember God's call. Learn to look at life in a better, with better sight. Don't just look at tomorrow bleak. It's all going to burn. And it is. Except for the things that will outlast the fire. And what you do for Christ outlasts. It lasts for eternity. Which brings me to my third and final point. And we're going to close with this. What did he say? He said, but you don't do anything for your brother Joseph. What is the cure for complacency? Start caring for your neighbors. Yep. Do you ever notice everything goes back to love God and love your neighbor as yourself? Whether they're your enemies whether they're your best friends, whether they're your family, it doesn't matter. They're your neighbor. Yep. The cure for complacency is looking outside of oneself to make a difference in the lives of others. You can do this. We all, even in our church, there's so many areas that you can get involved in. Did you know we need more help with our computer system? We need more help with our camera crew. We have our interns doing it now because we want to train more people how to do it. You know, we need more help to be able to see, hi, people online, uh, the, the people that watch us, uh, and there is people that watch us online. For those who are online, hello again. Um, we need people trained up so that they can use the camera. We need people helping out with our youth ministries, with our kids' ministries. We need people helping out with our outreach ministries, the safe groups in our, our prisons. You know, they always need help, they, whether it be purchasing Bibles and material or whether it be physically helping them. You know, there is so much we can do for Christ. Our church, for a small church, we do a lot for Christ in the kingdom. But don't, don't get complacent. We need you to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We, we do not act like a small church. We try to do more than our church can do. But we also serve a really big God. Amen. And I'm so excited to see what he's done. 
And I look around, and now we have the 9 o'clock service, so we do three services uh, every Sunday. And I'm so excited. Now we have room to grow. We have literally doubled the capacity for our church by moving to two services at this campus. I am so excited because we have a great foundation started in our first service. And some of the people that you used to look around and see, where are they at? They didn't quit church. They're coming to first service. So I'm excited for that because God is going to grow and bless both services. Now we have room to invite more people to this service. And we have room to invite them to the 9 o'clock service. And at our other campus, there's room to have more people there as well. So excited to see what God is doing. But I don't want to be complacent and say to myself, eh, it's no big deal. Somebody else will take care of it. You know, I was uh, driving home from church camp out. And my uh, window was open. And uh, like I said in the beginning of service, um, they told me it was, you know, flapping in the wind. No big deal. I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was one of those roll open ones. And that really wouldn't have been a big deal because it would probably just blow in the mini blinds. And I really didn't think anything of it. Until the window itself blew off. The window is one of, was one of those, um, one of my kids at uh, Muslim Judah, he had unlatched the um, thing so that we could open it. Or maybe I unlatched it so he could have some fresh air or something. And it was one of those emergency opening windows. So it was like doing one of these things. So when they're like, hey, you need to pull over and fix your window, I'm like, ah, it's fine. The, I remember Brian going, it's not fine. And I'm like, ah, no big deal. So I drove home and I'm like, uh oh, I got no window. <laughs> cost me 400 bucks I know I'm like the window's this big what they have to hand carve it I mean, 400 bucks but uh, I was so mad but you know why it cost me because I was complacent what's the eternal cost for a church to become complacent I think that was hard enough okay you can stand up let's let's close in prayer I'm going to do two things first. Something that I, I have uh, talked to Jim about and some of the you know, board members about that I really want to try to have a little bit more. We're a large enough crowd where I can't necessarily have a personal contact touch with everybody. But I thought, you know, we as a church, we need to have that personal contact touch. Uh, and I also want us to learn to pray for each other. So I have all these things in my mind. I'm going, yeah, how do I help our church take the next step in their growth process? Well, one way is to bear one another's burdens, to have compassion on each other and love on each other. So if you're like me and you've been fighting complacency, Jim, do you want to get some background music? If you're like me and you've been fighting some complacency, would you be honest today and just kind of raise your hand? If your hand is not raised, can you look around? Can everybody just gather around those who are their hands are raised? Keep your hand.